Good morning. Whoop. Welcome to Ceramic Storytime with Sue. Uh, today, I'm going to read you a blog post that I wrote called How to Calibrate Your Kiln Sitter for Accurate Firings. Um, so if you're here live, just say hello in the comment section and just let me know that you can hear me and see me and everything like that. Um, so if you want to follow along as I read this article, you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash kiln sitter. And that'll take you to my blog post. Um, so let me just, I'm just checking in on Facebook. I just want to make sure that everything is going smoothly here. Um, so I looks like I'm live. <laughs> so if you can see me, just say hello in the comment section. Oh, hi, Lily. Hooray. Okay, perfect. So my sound is working. My video is working. I can continue. So again, I'm going to read my article called How to Calibrate Your Kiln Sitter for Accurate Firings. And as I read this article, feel free to type comments in the comment section, and then I'll answer them as I go. And oh, hi, Vinky. Hi, Mary. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you for coming. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And um, so the scrolling link on the bottom of the screen is where you can go to um, access this blog post here. And let's get started. So again, you can um, ask me questions as I go and I will answer them for you. Um, so I just want to give a little shout out to my teacher at Kootenai School of the Arts, KSA as we call it, um, who taught me how to take kilns apart and put them back together. And this is a skill that has been so valuable, um, just like kiln issues, especially if you don't buy a kiln that is brand new. Um, so all, all the kilns that I have, which you'll see in a minute, I have four kilns, um, they're all hand-me-down kilns. And so kilns need regular maintenance. Um, and so knowing how to replace elements and calibrate my kiln sitter, um, how to, you know, replace thermocouples in digital kilns, that sort of thing has come in super handy. So um, Gary, if you're ever watching this or listening to this, I just want to thank you. He taught me some very good habits. Um, he's a very uh, thorough teacher and I really look up to him. Um, and so I've taken his teachings and uh, and use them quite a lot. And now I want to share them with you. So here we go. How to calibrate your kiln sitter for accurate firings. And if you go to this blog post, um, you can also download this article as a PDF um, just by clicking the link on this page. And then uh, you'll have to enter your email address and then it'll be sent right to you. <clears throat> Um, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, a version of this blog post is going to be featured in the November issue of Ceramics Monthly Magazine. So I'm pretty excited about that too. It'll be in the tips and tools section. So you'll see, um, you'll have the instructions there as well. So how the kiln sitter works. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm just going to have a little sip of water. Okay. Okay, so if you're anything like me, then your first kiln wasn't or isn't going to be the digital programmable kind. Many of us start out with a manual kiln that we got secondhand, and then one day we may have a chance to upgrade. Full disclosure, I have four different sized kilns in my home studio and none of them are digital or programmable. 
I operate digital kilns in the studio where I work, but at home, I'm still rocking the manual kiln sitter kilns. Uh, so here's my kiln family. <laughs> so we've got this little teeny tiny test kiln. I believe it's um, eight inches by eight inches and six inches tall on the inside. And then there is um, another little test kiln here. And then this is the kiln that I got right when I graduated from KSA, that's in Nelson, BC. Um, this kiln was given to me um, by someone who hadn't used it in years. So that was wonderful. And then this is a larger kiln that I acquired more recently. Um, yeah, so that's my kiln family. And as you can see there, these three are kiln sitter kilns. And then this one doesn't have a sitter, it just has a peep. And so I just watch the cones in this kiln. So manual kilns have switches for turning up the heat and they have a nifty contraption called a kiln sitter that uses a melting bending cone to shut the kiln off at a specific temperature. The kiln sitter uses a small pyrometric sitter cone that's propped onto two, two cone supports inside the kiln with a sensing rod laying over the center. The cones are made by Orton, who also makes small rectangular bars for this purpose. I haven't personally used the bars, but they are meant to be more accurate because they aren't tapered. So um, they don't go down to a point, they're just the uniform all the way across. Um, so when you have these sitter cones, one of the tricks is that you want to get this sensing rod right in the middle of the sitter cone. Um, because if you have it more to the thick side, then your kiln's gonna shut off a little bit later. And if you have it more to the thin side, then your kiln would shut off a little bit earlier. So you can also use that to your advantage if your kiln is under over firing just by a little bit, you could all, always um, shift that little sitter cone to one side or the other just to adjust um, how soon or late the kiln sh shuts off. So the sensing rod goes from the inside of the kiln to the outside. On the outside, at the other end of the sensing rod, there's a claw, so I'll move the photo down. There's a claw holding a trigger plate that's attached to a weight. These external parts create a latching mechanism. When the latch is up and being held by the claw, the kiln can be turned on. As the kiln approaches its target temperature, the cone in the kiln sitter will soften. As the cone softens, the weight of the sensing rod causes it to bend. So this is the cone like um, up here. So it's pink before the firing and then it turns white as it starts melting. Um, so the weight of the sensing rod um, causes the soft cone to bend. The sensing rod sinks down into the cone, causing the claw on the outside to rise. So here we have the claw um, that's attached to the other end of the sensing rod here. And so as the sensing rod goes down on the inside of the kiln, then the claw goes up on the outside. When the claw rises up, it releases the latch weight, which falls down and shuts the kiln off. And so here we have a little video of the sitter falling. Such a good sound, right? <laughs> um, so in my studio, it's, you know, like it's outside of my house. And so when uh, I have my kilns going and I want to be in my house and not in my studio, then I have a baby monitor. Um, and that I carry around with me when the kiln is about to reach temperature. And so um, when I hear that sound, I'm always like so excited to, and I run out and I check my cones to make sure that um, it's the right time for the sitter to fall. So here we go into kiln sitter maintenance. Just like any piece of equipment, the kiln sitter requires a bit of maintenance. Not a lot, but if your witness cones are telling you that your kiln is shutting off early or late, then there's a good chance your kiln sitter needs some attention. Most kiln sitter parts never need to be replaced unless they're broken or missing. 
The main parts that generally need to be replaced after a lot of firings are the metal parts on the inside of the kiln. So those are these parts here. Um, also these metal parts here. So um, this includes the sensing rod and the cone supports. So those are the metal parts that eventually wear down. Because these parts are metal and are subject to such high heat, they become oxidized and thin or warped and worn out. The porcelain tube assembly, as you see here, that the sensing rod passes through can get knocked by kiln shelves so it becomes cracked or broken. Um, so if it becomes cracked or broken, it will need to be replaced. If you take good care of it, you may never have to replace it. So this tube assembly here is what goes from the outside of the kiln into the inside of the kiln. Um, and it is made of porcelain and um, it can break, it can chip and crack. So you wanna just make sure as you're loading your kiln that you avoid um, hitting this with your kiln shelves. To replace the sensing rod and the tube assembly yourself, my advice is to take lots of notes and photos as you remove the old ones and reverse the steps to install new ones. So whenever I'm taking a kiln apart, um, especially if it's a kiln that I'm not familiar with, um, sometimes I work on other people's kilns, um, so I always take pictures as I'm um, taking it apart so that just in case there's like a wire that I'm not sure uh, where it went um, so I can make sure that I put it back together exactly as it was. So here is a great diagram from the ceramicshop.com of all the kiln sitter parts in case you need to replace some of them. So it literally labels every little screw, every piece of the kiln sitter mechanism. Um, so it's just interesting if you want to go check out this picture and just like see what all the parts are called. Um, yeah, it's a pretty neat contraption, the kiln sitter. So aside from a replacing parts, the most common thing you'll need to do to maintain your kiln sitter is to calibrate it so that it shuts off at the right time. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do in this post. So how to know if your kiln sitter needs calibrating. The kiln sitter is designed so that when the sitter cone bends to a 90 degree angle, the kiln shuts off. And when the kiln shuts off, the witness cone of the same number should be fully bent as well. So here is a photograph of the Orton small cone box. Um, and it says, for best results, position small cone with numbered side down in the kiln sitter. The cone should be deformed to a 90 degree angle after firing. See illustration below. So here's the sitter cone at a 90 degree angle. So that's perfect. So if your sitter cone is more of a U shape, that means that your, um, that your sitter isn't falling soon enough. So um, it needs to be adjusted so that it shuts off a little bit sooner. Um, and then if you're and if your sitter cone has um, a wider angle, then your kiln is probably shutting off a little too early. Um, which I'm probably going to say in this paragraph. <laughs> if your sitter cone is bent to more or or less than a 90 degree angle, then your sitter probably needs calibrating. Make sure you're always placing the sitter cone so the sensing rod sits in the center of the cone for accurate results. If the rod is sitting on the thinner side of the cone, the kiln will shut off early. If the rod is sitting on the thicker side, the kiln will shut off late. If you're using the rectangular bars, then there isn't a thin or thick side. Just make sure the rod is placed over the center. When you put witness cones in your cone six firing, which you absolutely should be doing, the tip of cone six should be bent over and pointing down towards the kiln shelf at the same time that the cone six sitter cone bends enough to release that trigger and wait to shut the kiln off. So this is here, this, these are the large witness cones. So this is how your cone six cone should look at the same time that your little sitter cone um, is bent at a 90 degree angle and, sh and therefore 
shutting the kiln off. <clears throat> this system works great as long as your sitter is calibrated properly and your sensing rod hasn't worn out. If your witness cones on the shelf at the level of your kiln sitter, so you can have cones on the bottom and the top, um, but for the most accurate reading, you um, your witness cones that are the closest to your kiln sitter. Um, if they don't look perfect when your kiln shuts off, then your sitter needs to be adjusted. This image shows how I like my cones to look. So we've got cone seven here that just has a very slight bend to it. And this is cone six with the tip just touching the kiln shelf. And then this is cone five, um, a little more melted here. Anytime I get a new kiln or I'm performing any maintenance on a kiln, or if my firings aren't completely perfect, the first thing I'll do is recalibrate my kiln sitter. It only takes a couple of minutes. So here are all the tools that you're gonna need <laughs> to calibrate your kiln sitter. For the calibration process, you need a little round device called a firing gauge. So that's what this little round disc is here. You should be able to get one at any ceramic supplier. You also need a teeny tiny screwdriver for the tiny set screw that holds the trigger plate in place on the latching mechanism. So my kiln needs a tiny flathead screwdriver. So here's one that came from Olympic Kilns. Um, so they're selling little teeny tiny kiln sitter screwdrivers. Um, but yours may be a Phillips. So the flathead is, um, you know, flathead, the Phillips is like the cross. Um, have a look at the set screw to find out. And the last thing you need is a pencil to mark where your trigger plate started. And this is the tip that uh, I got from Gary Graham and um, has been so useful. So I can't wait to share it with you. The three things that you need to calibrate your kiln sitter, firing gauge, tiny screwdriver, and a pencil. So here we go into the steps, how to calibrate your kiln sitter. Step one, slide the firing gauge over your sensing rod and cone supports. The sensing rod goes through the hole in the center and the cone supports go through the grooves on the side. So here's the sensing rod and then here are the cone supports. And so you just slide this disc right over. You'll have to like push the sensing rod up a little bit to get it to um, fit through this hole in the center. Um, and here's an older firing gauge that doesn't have um, the same bottom that kind of holds the cone supports in the grooves, um, but either of these should work just fine. This places the sensing rod at the same angle that it would be if the small sitter cone was bent perfectly at a 90 degree angle. So if the sitter cone was in here and melted perfectly, then this is the position that the sensing rod would be in at that moment. Um, when the rod is at this angle, the latch should be just ready to fall. So example of two different firing gauges. Okay, so this is the latch here. So when, this, when the firing gauge is in place, then this should be like just touching this and just ready to fall and shut the kiln off. Okay, step two. With, with the firing gauge in place, swing the latch weight upwards and see where the top of the trigger plate comes in relation to the bottom of the claw. So here's the top of the trigger plate and then here is the bottom of the claw. Is there a gap between the bottom of the claw and the top of the trigger plate? Or does the plate move snugly past the claw or does the claw block the plate from moving past? So this trigger plate here slides up and down. And so when you have your firing gauge in place, um, this could be just brushing the, the bottom of the claw or there could be a gap here, um, or this could be up and, um, and blocked by the claw from falling down. So what you want is for the trigger plate to come into contact with the claw with no gap in between, like you see here. 
It shouldn't be so high that it can't move past the claw, nor should it be so low that it moves by without touching the claw. They should brush against each other. If that's the case, then your kiln is calibrated. If the trigger plate is too high or too low, then it needs to be adjusted. So this is the tip that I got from Gary. Um, to mark the trigger plate with a pencil before you make any adjustments so you know what level it started at. So I just draw a line right across here before I loosen this and move it up or down. And that way you know where you started. In case you um, let this slide a little bit too far, you can always go back to where it was and then make sure you're just sliding it a little bit in either direction. Then use your tiny screwdriver to loosen the screw just enough that the trigger plate will slide up and down. So this little screw goes in and puts tension on the, um, the trigger plate here. And so if you loosen this, then the trigger plate will slide up and down. Adjust the plate so that it's just touching the bottom of the claw and then tighten the screw back up again. And that's it. That's all it takes to calibrate your kiln sitter. So now, what if your calibrated kiln isn't shutting off at the right time? That's a very good question. I'm gonna have a sip of coffee. Okay, so if you followed the steps above for calibrating your sitter and your kiln is still not firing accurately, it could be because you have a worn out sensing rod. When the sensing rod is heated and cooled, it will oxidize and the outer layer flakes off, just like any piece of rusting metal. You may notice little green or black flecks on your kiln shelves after a firing. As this happens over and over, eventually the sensing rod will become much thinner than, it, than when it started. It may even wear down to a point. This can affect the timing of when your kiln shuts off. If your sensing rod is worn down to a point, then it's not the same size as when it started, so the rod won't sit at the same angle. So here are three photos of the sensing rods in three of my kilns. Um, so this first photo is a fairly new sensing rod, and then um, these ones are just a little bit more worn out. So you can see how nice and smooth this one is. And then this one is just a little bit thinner, a little bit warped, um, a, a little rough around the edges. Um, so they do um, disintegrate over time. And so um, it's a good thing to replace your sensing rod um, if it does wear down to a point or possibly even before it gets that bad. <laughs> So since the rod rests on the cone on the inside of the kiln, a thinner point will have it sitting a bit lower. Uh, here's my photo here of what I'm talking about. Um, since it's on a fulcrum like a teeter-totter, this means the claw on the outside of the kiln will sit a bit higher. One end goes down, the other end goes up. If the claw starts out higher, it doesn't have to move as much before it releases the latch to shut the kiln off. This results in an underfired kiln load. So here's a graphic to show what I mean. So this is a new sensing rod here. And um, as you can see, it's cylindrical, nice and uniform. And so it sits um, touching the cone. And now if you have a worn out sensing rod, if it's sitting um, at the same angle, because it's worn down to a point, the point is gonna sit a little bit higher compared to the cone. And so when this goes down to touch the cone, then the claw on the outside of the kiln moves up, which means your kiln is gonna shut off a little bit earlier uh, because it just doesn't have as far to travel uh, before it like uh, releases the trigger plate and lets the kiln shut off. So this is why um, if you have, if your sensing rod is wearing out, um, then your firings may not be as accurate and you can adjust your 
your cone to the thicker side um, to uh, compensate for this um, until you replace your sensing rod. Uh, if your sensing rod is worn out like this, I recommend ordering a new sensing rod for your kiln. And in the meantime, you can follow the steps below to adjust your sitter so it shuts off later. So how to adjust your sitter so it shuts off earlier or later. If your calibrated kiln sitter is consistently over or under firing, then you can override the calibration process by sliding the plate further up or down, depending on whether you want the kiln to shut off earlier or later. If you want the kiln to shut off earlier, then slide the trigger plate down. So you'll just slide it down a tiny bit and then your kiln will shut off earlier. If you want the kiln to stay on longer, then slide the trigger plate up um, and then it will take longer it'll have the claw will have longer to travel before it can shut the kiln off you'll have to experiment with how much you slide it up or down this is where the plate um, this is where marking the plate with a pencil first will guide you if you accidentally move the plate too much you can bring it back to where it started and then make sure to slide it only a little bit if your kiln's over or under firing just a little bit like less than a cone, I would only move the trigger plate by a hair or two. So you have your pencil mark, you're moving it like just above or below the pencil mark. If it's a full cone over or under, you may need to move it a millimeter or two. So a millimeter isn't very big either. So you're either moving it a hair, which is less than a millimeter, or you're moving it a millimeter. I would start with less and then increase a bit after a test firing if needed. That's also what the pencil marks are for. So you can move a little bit at a time and then see how much each adjustment affects when the kiln shuts off. You'll usually have a better idea of how much to move it the second time you adjust it. If you're present for the end of the firing and watching your your witness cones through the peep, you can always shut your kiln off yourself if the sitter doesn't fall on time, or you can turn your kiln back on if it shuts off before your cones have melted. So if your kiln, sh if your kiln sitter shuts off and you check your witness cones and they're not quite bent yet, um, then you can just pull that the latch up a little bit um, and push the on button again. And then you just let it rest um, very gently down and the kiln should stay on, but then you need to be monitoring your kiln so that you shut it off at the right time. And then you just hit the, hit the kiln sitter and that will um, shut the kiln off as though it had fallen down. Important safety announcements. When making these adjustments, you're guessing how far to slide the trigger plate up or down. It's very easy to move it too much, which could mean your kiln won't shut off at the right time. I very strongly recommend being present for the end of your firing to watch your cones fall and make sure your sitter doesn't shut the kiln off too early or late. I actually very highly recommend being present for the end of every single firing. The kiln sitter is not a fail safe method, method for shutting your kiln off. I've had a kiln sitter get stuck to the cone supports and, um, oh, a sitter cone. So the little cone, um, it got stuck to the cone supports and the kiln just kept on firing. So uh, because the sitter was stuck, the sensing rod um, wasn't, it wasn't moving at all. And so the kiln would have just kept firing and firing if I hadn't been there to monitor it. Who knows how long the kiln would have fired for. I've also had my sensing rod stick to the top of the tube assembly. So you've got your tube assembly that goes uh, from the inside to the outside of the kiln and the sensing rod goes down the center. And so when, I, um, when the kiln is off, um, if you flick the sensing rod up, it should just fall back down. And so what I found out was that it was just sticking up and it wasn't falling down. So my kiln wouldn't have shut off then either. 
So what I discovered was the tube had filled with metal flakes from being fired so many times and shedding away so many layers of oxidation. It seemed like the metal flakes had a magnetic effect on the rod that was causing it to stick wherever I pushed it. So even if the cone was melting, the sensing rod wasn't actually resting on the cone. It was stuck to the top, so the kiln never would have shut off if I wasn't there watching it. Um, I ended up sucking out the metal flakes from the tube assembly with a vacuum, and then the rod was able to fall freely again, no longer sticking to the top. So now I just test my sensing rod, uh, make sure it moves up and down freely before every firing, um, just to make sure. Uh, just some comments here. Uh, Elizabeth says, thank you for such great information. You're welcome. You have a wonderful presentation manner and so much knowledge. Ah, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. That's so nice. Lily says, Sue, how would someone test the firing after making an adjustment if they don't have pottery to put into the kiln? I recently suggested to a friend to load the kiln shelves with kiln shelf posts so the kiln was not empty. Is this a good idea? Yeah, that that's a good idea if you want to do a test firing um, before you fire your pots. But I always just um, do a test firing with my pots. Um, and I'm just there making sure that it shuts off at the right time. So I've done my adjustment, then I fill my kiln with pots and, um, and I'm there at the end of the firing. And if it shuts off early, then I know to adjust it again the next time, or if it shuts off late, um, I'm just there. And so I'm not actually um, just doing a test firing, I'm just making sure that my adjustments were accurate the next time I fire a load of pots. But you could, if you want to be sure, um, you could fire an empty kiln with uh, kiln shelves and posts. Um, if you just want to be sure before you put your pots in, then that's definitely something that you could do. Um, but yeah, I would just fire my pots and just make sure that I was there at the end. Um, better safe than sorry. So since it's so easy for something to go wrong and I've been badly burned in a fire, I never walk away from a kiln and trust it to shut off on its own. How many times have you heard of a pottery studio burning down? Once is too many. I'm always there to make sure the sitter falls and the kiln shuts off. I may go out for a few hours, but I'm always there at the end. Even if your kiln has a timer to shut it off, I don't trust mechanical devices like this to work every single time. Call me paranoid or overly cautious, I don't mind. I admit that it's highly unlikely that your kiln's going to burst into flames, and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but there's still the risk of your entire kiln load being overfired, causing your clay to bloat and your glazes to run and I'm not willing to risk ruining my kiln load of pots that I've worked so hard on. I want my cones to be perfect when the kiln shuts off, and the only way to ensure that is to be there watching the cones melt at the end of the firing. So I am very picky about my glazes, and so I'm just not going to trust that um, that the, set, the sitter's going to shut off at the perfect moment, because I want my cones to look exactly like they looked um, in the photo in the early part of this article where the cone six is just touching the kiln shelf and the cone seven is just starting to bend. And that is um, how my glazes work perfectly. And so if it's a little bit under fired, then the glazes, um, they just lose a quality that I really like. And if they're over fired, then they're running all over the place. Um, so I just make sure that um, that it's perfect every time, <laughs> or I do my best. Uh, sometimes it would be late and my kiln would be taking forever and I'd have to go to bed. I would set an alarm for every half hour and go out to check the kiln. It's annoying, just ask my boyfriend, but it's important. The life of a potter, right? 
Uh, tips for monitoring those late night firings. Eventually, I got a baby monitor, as I said earlier, so I can hear the sitter fall from inside the house. It works great. And to take it a step further, I now have a setup where I use a baby monitor app, so you can get a, an app for your mobile device that connects two mobile devices over Wi-Fi. So I have a tab, my tablet set up in the kiln room um, with the camera pointing at the kiln sitter. And then that is connected to my cell phone in the house where I can actually watch the video of, of what's going on. And so I have my tablet, I've got my, I have a digital pyrometer. I have a thermocouple that I stick in one of the peeps of my manual kiln and then my digital pyrometer. So I can see on the video, my digital pyrometer reading and the kiln sitter. So at a glance, I can see if the sitter is up or if it has fallen down. Uh, so that is super fancy technology. Um, but if you have two uh, mobile devices that um, you can download apps to, then um, it's super simple. Uh, but for your safety and the safety of everyone around you, please don't leave your kilns unattended, especially after adjusting your kiln sitter. Okay, safety rant over. I hope you found this post useful and can now get your kiln firing to the right temperature by calibrating your kiln sitter. If it helped you, please share it with someone who might need to read it. So that is the end of my blog post. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this and I hope you give it a try. Um, please post in the Facebook group. Um, if you have any questions, if you buy your fire engage, if you're wondering if it's set up properly, you can take pictures as you're adjusting and post them in the group and um, you can just tag me and then I can uh, just make sure that um, everything is going smoothly or you can come back to this post. Um, you can download it and print it out, print out the instructions. Uh, again, here's a little uh, link to download the blog post as a PDF. And that's that. And so this replay will be posted on my website below the blog post. Um, and there will also be an audio version uploaded to SoundCloud. So if you want to listen while you're um, working in your studio or on a walk or something, then that would be great too. Um, Mary says, thank you. I've already shared your post with another new older kiln owner. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, like kilns are actually very simple devices. Um, when it comes down to it, like they're not super complicated. And so um, if you can get to know just like the few things that you can adjust and control yourselves, um, then when things go wrong, then you, you know, you don't have to call someone in every time something's going off with your kiln, um, you can fix it yourself. So Vinky says, awesome, thanks for sharing. Thank you, Vinky, for coming. I know it's very late for you. Um, so thank you for joining me for story time. And um, I might do next week's story time on Saturday, just um, in case some people work Monday to Friday um, and are missing out on this, but I'll be sending out an email on Tuesday to let you all know what is going on. And if you have any suggestions for um, blog posts that are on my website that you want me to read out, then um, please just send them my way and uh, I can do that for you. So enjoy your Friday. Hope you all have a great day and see you next story time.